this straight, Mark. You're going to burn a hole through that piece of cardboard without using a match. Or a right. bolt of lightning? Mm-hmm. Okay, Mark, how? Very simple. All you need to do this experiment is A, B, and C. A, a piece of cardboard. B, a magnifying glass. And C, the sun. Well, where's C? C, coming right up. again one final time before the sun really rises. Today you will see how light passes from a source through a lens to create an image. And you will see light making rainbow. But light does not light up my life. Dark, more dark, perpetual night. <laughs> Starting all over again from A, the piece of cardboard, we go to B, the magnifying glass. <laughs> Gee, you look funny. That's because the glass is a lens, all curved. So it makes everything distorted and bigger. And you look funny to me, too. What you want to do is move the lens, get it to where everything looks sharp and clear. So we see funny face and not fuzzy face. And that happens to be not so different from the way your own eye works. Today, we're going to look at your eye. Hmm. Aha! Ah, that's better. Now, this is your iris. It's colored brown, green, or blue to keep out light. And this is your pupil, a hole to let in light. It gets small when there's a lot of light, and when it's dark, your pupil gets larger to let in more light. Now, why is light important? Because it reflects off everything into your cornea, then through your pupil and lens, and makes a picture at the back of your eye, on the retina. So what if it's upside down? The brain thinks an upside down image on the retina is right side up. And that's how you see. Now, do you see? See? And you know what's fantastic? Sometimes, if a person's going blind, a part of the eye can be replaced. Here's a nice rock with thermometer. Yeah, look at that big tree over there. Oh, doesn't it look pretty, the, the tree against yeah. the sky? What kind of trees do you think these are? I don't know. What matters to me is they're green. Can you tell me what you liked about the park today? I kind of say, I like when we roll down the hill, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was fun. But you tripped, didn't you? Yeah, I, you know, it was, it was so steep that, that I just fell. And, and thank God the bottom was there. Do you remember what it was like before you could see? Well, it was like black. Do you remember who the first person was that you saw? M my mother, I think. How did you feel seeing your mom for the first time? Oh, I just felt great. Do you know how you got, you were able to get your sight? Well, 
Because they did a cornea transplant. Excuse me. I just met little Jimmy. Do you know Jimmy? Yes, I do. What was wrong with Jimmy's cornea? Well, Jimmy's cornea, when he was born, it was cloudy, dirty, like a dirty window. Mm -hmm. So the light wouldn't pass through. So what did you do? How were you able to fix it? Well, his doctor called us up at the eye bank told us that he needed a new cornea for Jimmy mm -hmm. to replace the damage on. Right. We didn't have anything for him, so we asked the other eye banks, and when we finally did get one, it was from Minnesota, a 19-year-old boy who had donated his eyes before he died. And what, what happened afterwards, after you got the eye? What happened then? The doctor took the donor eye, and he took the cornea off. He removed the bad the damaged cornea from Jimmy's eye, and he replaced it with the new cornea. How did he get the corneas off, off the donor eye? It's not that hard to do. Let me show you. Oh, wow. This is what a good cornea looks like. What did he do with it once he had it off the good eye? Well, he takes the damaged one out of, say, Jimmy's eye, and he replaces it with this. And you see how clear that is? Yeah. Can all blindness be cured by transplants like this one? No, because people with damaged corneas right now. Okay, about to recommence. Everybody ready? Ready. And waiting. Now, we still have A, the cardboard. And we have B, the magnifying glass, now known as the lens, which we're going to use to focus C, the light source, over which we have very little control. I don't want lightning. I want sunshine and not rainbows. But don't you realize what a rainbow is? It is light. A ray of sunshine bursting through a raindrop, breaking up into all the colors that are inside pure white light. Hey, that's like a piece of a rainbow. Uh-huh, it's called the spectrum. But if you want an easier name, try Roy G. Biff. Roy G. who? The first letter of every color. Red, orange, yellow, R, O, Y, Roy. G for green, then B for blue, I for indigo, and V for violet. B, I, V. Roy, G, Viv. That's all the light we see, right? Right. But you know something? Down here, next to the red, that's part of the light we don't see with the naked eye. It's not a color to our eyes, but it's there. It's called infrared. It's beyond the red. And you know something? It's only with a special kind of camera we can actually see it. And guess what this is? Well, it's wet, you can drink it, and it runs hot and cold. That's right, water. And you're not seeing a picture of me. You're seeing a picture of the heat that comes from me, all over me. You need a special kind of camera to see this, and Gene Schultz is the man who has it. What kind of camera is this, Gene? It's an infrared camera, Lisa. It sees temperature differences. Everything gives off infrared at uh, a level equal to its temperature. This camera reads the infrared just like we see daylight. We see different colors. It sees different temperatures and transforms them into a television-like picture. So you mean we have body heat on the surface of our skin? Definitely, yes, uh, and in varying degrees. And that's what we see when we look at this? That's correct. And what is it called? What do you do? Well, I'm a thermographer, and what we do is called thermography. One of the things we have to do is to fill this little container with liquid nitrogen. What is that? It's a very, very cold liquid. It's 320 degrees below zero. Whoa. And it keeps the working part of the camera cold Woo. so that the only heat it sees is what comes in through the lens. Much the same as in a regular camera, you have to keep all the light out except what comes through the lens. Right. Okay. okay, so then when you take the pictures with this camera, you see heat? Yes, we see the heat that's coming off of everything. Everything gives off heat in infrared rays depending upon how warm or cold it is. For example, the places where you're wearing clothes, look to the camera to be cool because you're holding heat in. 
So you mean when, when we put clothes on, we're keeping our own body heat in to keep us warmer? That's exactly true. Let me show you what it looks like on my son, Charlie. We can see that where his jacket is open and his throat is exposed and his forehead right. are warm. And the areas that are covered, Charlie, close up the neck of the jacket and we should see him holding the heat in. Yeah. Okay, now open it back up and we can see the heat escaping. Now take off your glasses, Charlie. There, we can see... Yeah, how come where his glasses well, were? Well, the glasses so were cold. preventing the heat from getting to the camera. Let me show you something neat with your hand. If you'll go over, hold your hand flat against the wall, and we'll look at you in the infrared. Just hold it there for about 10 seconds. Just go ahead. There? Yes, go ahead over there. What should I do, just press down? Just press down hard. Okay, that should be plenty long enough. Now come back here. And look what we can see. Oh, right. So then you can, you can tell when someone has been there after they're gone. If, if they've touched something for some length of time to leave heat, yes, we can. Oh, so that would come in really handy for detective work, huh? Oh, that's right. Let me show you something that the infrared camera can see that our eyes can't. Look at the screen over there. Uh -huh. I think there's someone behind there, and I think it's Charlie. You do, huh? Charlie, is that you? Yes. Okay. I believe you. You can see his image in the infrared. Now step out, Charlie. There he comes. Well, what else is, is thermography good for? I mean, it's fun to play with and see different parts of your body warm up and cool down, but there must be some other uses for it. Well, yes, there is. You can look at uh, heat loss in buildings. We look at walls to see whether there are insulation problems and the buildings might be wasting a lot of energy. We can look at uh, a herd of cows, for example. Pick the ones that are the warmest, uh, and they're probably sick. Uh, one time, an escaped convict was found in the woods. No kidding. Yes. How did they do that? Well, he's warmer than the surrounding surfaces. So from a helicopter, they looked down at the woods and picked out the warm body. Wow, that's great. What other kind of things that are there that give off heat that we can see with only a thermography camera? Uh, why don't we go in the kitchen and I'll show you. Yeah, okay. Okay, Lisa, you're going to notice in the infrared that... When I turn on the cold water, it's going to turn a bluish color. As we go to warm, it should get up into the yellows and oranges. Now, there's something you can't see with your eyes by looking at the faucet, right. but you can certainly see it in the infrared, can't you? Yeah, this is, this is all dark blue and green. That's the cold That's right. water, right? Now, yes, it is. As I go to the warmer water, it should change to oranges and reds. Is it getting there yet? Sure is. Even the whole sink area is turning orange and red. Everything warm really shows up on the screen. If I were to take my finger and write something, it would be like writing with invisible ink. Sure would. Great. I've always wanted to do a little graffiti and not get in trouble for it. Oh, that's just down at Roy's end of things, the red end. You should see what's up at Biv's end beyond the violet. Don't see anything. You can't see anything, but bugs can. They can see some colors that you and I can't see. What kind of colors are those? Well, there's one color called ultraviolet. They're very bright ultraviolet colors. You and I won't see them at all. But insects can see them, and they use them. They use them to tell each other apart. Right. They can also use them in other ways. What other ways are that? Well, if you look around here, for example, there are a lot of flowers. We can look at some, but maybe we should let him go first. What do you say? Okay. See if he can fly off easily. There we go. Hey, we've got some really nice flowers here. Yeah, how about that? These are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Now, these are violet. Are these the ones you're talking about? No. I'm talking about a color that we can't see. And the only reason we call it ultraviolet is not because it's violet, but because it's literally on the other side of violet. You know, when you're looking at a rainbow, a whole sequence of colors going from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to violet and then color stops right but not for an insect on the other side of the violet the ultraviolet there is that other color which you and i can't see on the mean, other side of this particular violet so that's insects, why it's called ultraviolet insects see more of a rainbow than we do they sure do okay well then which one of these flowers here uh, there's a black eyed susan on our right that particular one has an ultraviolet pattern you know what we can do we could pick one of them and take it to the lab. Whoa, that's incredible. That, look at that, it's beautiful. 
Here are the dark areas, that's where the ultraviolet is not reflected, and the tips where the ultraviolet is reflected are very bright. Mm -hmm. And you remember the way you see these petals, they're evenly bright all the way across. They yeah. reflect yellow. But now for the insect, this is divided into two parts. One part, the tip here, which reflects, and one part, the base, which absorbs. Now you said something about butterflies having patterns on, on their wings. They do, they have ultraviolet patterns, and there's the butterfly. Front wings, the back wings have the same color of orange. Right. But if you look at them in ultraviolet, and we can go to the screen for that, there you go. That's fantastic. Isn't it? It's totally changed. Front wings are bright, and the hind wings are dark. And that's how they tell each other apart? That's right. The female has all four wings dark. Uh -huh. There are no bright front wings. So this is a male because these wings are light. That's right. That's the male. So insects see things totally different. They see flowers different. They see each other different. That's exactly it. And it took us a long time to learn that. As a matter of fact, I happen to have a picture which has a spider and a flower both together. You want to see that? In the same picture? In the same picture. Sure. There it is. Now that's an incredible set of pictures. Isn't it? <coughs> well, up on to top see. is, uh, again, you know, the way we see it. Mm -hmm. The yellow flower with a yellow spider on it. Uh -huh. And at the bottom... It's well, ultraviolet. It speaks for itself. And the colors are totally different. Now tell me, is there any way that people can see uh, ultraviolet flowers or, or insects without having the use of a special camera or something like that. Like, can I get some glasses or something? No, you can't. You're going to have to rely on that television camera. Really? Or on something like it. Technology is going to have to be your help. Unless uh -huh. you learn to talk to honeybees. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. Okay, Mark, describe this experiment for me again. Yeah, what exactly are you trying to prove? <sighs> that. If you take flammable object A and focus through lens B a ray or rays of light from source C, like, for instance, the sun, Maybe, just maybe, you'll be able to burn a teeny tiny little hole. Firebug. Yeah. It'll just smolder a little. What's really dangerous is if you look right at the sun. That can hurt your eyes. Well, how do astronomers study the sun without looking at it? Oh, well, they use a very special kind of telescope. At Kick Peak, the world's largest solar telescope produces a reflected image of the sun. I talked to astronomer Bruce Gillespie about how this telescope works. Are we inside the telescope now? Yeah, we're inside the telescope right now. We're at ground level right here. Mm -hmm. There's 200 feet of telescope above us, and 300 feet of it is, has been dug out right from the rocks in the mountain. At the very top of the telescope is a large, flat mirror. I see some clouds going right across it. Yeah, you can see, uh, you can actually see the beam of the sunlight coming down the telescope. It's reflecting the light from the sun uh -huh. down the whole length of the telescope to the bottom. And there's a mirror at the bottom of the telescope that reflects the sunlight back up to the where you're right where we are here. The tricky part is, uh, is keeping the, the sun moving through the sky. You've got to keep it stationary in the telescope. So as the sun moves, you move the mirrors with the right. sun. And you get an image of the sun stationary wherever you want to look at it. You want to burn a hole in this piece of cardboard? Yeah. That's easy. Try a laser. Here, Lisa, whenever we go into a laser lab, we always have to put on goggles. Why? It's for safety reasons, because the light from a laser is so intense that it could burn your eyes out. No kidding, really? Put them on, put them on right now so we can over that? Sure. Hi, Ralph. These are the samples that I brought by for you to test with your laser. Where's the laser? Why? It's right here in this big, long box right in front of you. Look at it. Smoke it. Yeah, as you can see, a laser beam is a very intense kind of beam. In other words, it has a lot of energy in it. So if I were to leave this card here long enough, the laser beam would burn a hole completely through this card. But where is the beam? I thought you would see like a, a beam of light. Well, there actually is a beam of light. But it turns out in the laser, the light beam is so thin that you normally can't see it. And because this room is so clean, the only way you would see it is if we took and put a lot of dust and dirt in the room. Because in that way, all the dust would scatter the light beam, and then you'd be able to see the beam. So if Ralph would like to take some dust and spray it in the room, then we'll be able to see we the beam. See it then? This, this is a smoker, which will diffuse the, the red light, and you'll be able to see it. There it is. You 
see now you can see oh, how wow. the beam is traveling as it comes out of the laser. Now that looks more like the kind of laser that I'm used to seeing. The beam comes from the laser, hits a beam splitter, and what a beam splitter is, it actually splits the beam. So part of the laser beam goes over here, hits this mirror, and then we send it on to our sample. But since you also want to know how much power is coming out of our laser, we take our laser beam, now part of it will now go through the beam splitter, hit another mirror, and then it will come along here, and it'll hit our detector. So we can always tell how much power we have coming out of our laser. Now what's the difference between this laser light and an ordinary light? Well, look, right here we have what amounts to a flashlight. We'll just turn it on, then we'll take our card back, put it in the beam. And if we put a little dust on it, you'll be able to really see the beam. Yeah. See how thin that beam is? Uh-huh. Well, one of the things that makes this different from a laser is the fact that in something like our flashlight, although the light looks white, it's really made up of all the colors of the rainbow. So there's red, green, and blue, and orange there. But if you look at our laser, there really is just one of the colors of the rainbow. So it's like taking this light and just picking out one of the colors, the red color. And so that all the light is just put in one color, the red color. If we got a different element, then the laser beam would be a different color? Oh, yeah. They have lasers that come in any color you want. They have green lasers and yellow ones and pink ones and green <laughs> ones. They even have lasers where the beam is really there, but you can never see it. And they call those infrared lasers. Why can't you see it? Well, it turns out that your eye is only sensitive to so many colors. And then there are other colors that are there, but your eye just can't see them. And so that's why we call them infrared. It just means that your eye can't see them. It doesn't mean that they're not there. Is there anything like the, um, the laser gun they have in Star Wars? Well, as it turns out that they are working on a laser gun, but nothing really exists. In fact, the kind of laser guns that exist are about as big as this laser in front of you. I mean, that would be kind of big to try to fit into your pocket. <laughs> so they got a long way to go yet before they can get the kind of power that you see in Star Wars. Well, what do they use lasers for, anyhow? I mean, like, what do they expect to be able to do with them in the future? Well, this particular laser here, we just use for research. But there are other kinds of lasers that people use for welding. Some people are doing art with lasers and sculpture. And they have lasers that they use in dentist's office um, and in <laughs> medicine. So in every field that exists, there's practically somebody trying to find a way to use the laser. It's really very simple. You've got the sun, focusing through B, the lens, onto <laughs> C. I've seen this experiment done before, out in the desert, really big, huge. At Sandia Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I saw how this power tower uses mirrors to capture the sun's energy. Cheryl, what are all these mirrors used for? Well, these mirrors are used to generate electricity. Huh? Do they have a name? They're called than... heliostats. What do you do with them? We aim all of these mirrors up to a focus point on that tall tower you see over there. You aim them up here? Mm -hmm. On the very top of the tower, see the white skinny thing with the black strip right in the center? Uh-huh. We shine all the light from every one of these mirrors up to that point. So what happens after you've gotten all the light up there? Up there we have water flowing through some tubes. Mm -hmm. Oh, the... and the heat from the sun heats up the water that's in the tubes. Right. And then what happens? And we get very hot steam. Mm -hmm. Which helps you to produce electricity. That's right. Can we take a look around? Sure, let's go back. Okay. I'm still not quite sure I understand how come the mirrors don't get hot. I mean, when I stand out in the sun, I get hot. That's because you're absorbing the heat from the sun. Uh -huh. The mirrors aren't absorbing any heat. They're only reflecting it all. Oh, I get it. And uh, the tower up there uh, absorbs the heat. Right. The tower is absorbing all the heat that's just reflected off the mirror. Is there any way for me to see how the tower works? Sure, let's go this way. What happens after we go through all these procedures? Say again. Um, after we go through these, then we have water flowing through the tube that I told you earlier about. Mm -hmm. After that, we bring on the mirrors, the reflections that we talked about earlier, onto that black strip on the receiver. 
then we can create this real hot steam. Open RFIV. RFIV has been confirmed open. Select safe file interval 20 seconds. It's on. Start DAS record. DAS record is on. Open RNHPV. RNHPV is on. Manually close the facility water bypass valve. Uh, the facility bypass valve has been closed, and uh, we have water flow. Now wait for receiver to pressurize the control. The receiver is pressurizing, and it's up to pressure on HPV going closed. Do you know how to get up there? It could get to about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Really? about life, where it comes from, all the colors that are in it, and how it's used by plants, animals, and people. Finally see what you mean. About time. You take A, any surface, focus through a lens, B. You got it. And light from a light source, C, like the sun right outside those windows. Exactly. And that's how you get an image on the cardboard, in the eye, or anywhere. Genius. Sheer genius. And that's why, scientifically speaking, of course, you look funnier than ever. Hey, you look kind of funny, too, sometimes, you know. I'm not the only hey, one. Whenever there's trouble, whenever there's trouble, we're the Bloodhound Gang. If you've got the crime, we've got the time, we're the Bloodhound Gang. Be sure to watch next time when 3 to 1 Contact brings you the exciting adventures of the Bloodhound Gang. 3 to 1 Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. It's a game show. It's a geography lesson. It's a mystery. It's the search for Carmen Sandiego, and it continues today at 4.30. Now stick around for Square One TV.